In this talk, we'll provide a comprehensive review of the complications that can occur after lung transplantation, show you how to approach the interpretation of a chest CT for lung transplant complications, and finally, practice taking 10 curated teaching cases together. We see lung transplants performed for many reasons, but just three reasons alone account for three quarters of all lung transplants. Emphysema, interstitial lung disease, and cystic fibrosis. With lung transplants, sometimes only one lung is replaced, and sometimes both lungs are. If we take this pie chart for all lung transplants and separate it into individual pie charts for single versus double lung transplants, it's apparent that double lung transplants are strongly preferred when the reason for transplantation is cystic fibrosis, while single or double lung trans may occur in patients for which the reason for transplantation is emphysema or interstitial lung disease. For many radiology residents, general radiologists, and other healthcare providers, approaching lung transplant patients can be a little intimidating. I have to admit I used to feel this way too until the day I happened to strike up a conversation with, of all people, this landscaper working on my next door neighbor's front yard. He and his team were about to move a tree from one part of my neighbor's property to another when he began talking to me about how tricky it can be to transplant trees and ensure that they survive afterwards. The moment he uttered the word transplant, my ears pricked up a bit. I was working back at Cleveland Clinic in those days, and few institutions were doing more lung transplants than we were which also meant that I was always looking for better ways to help our radiology residents conceptualize lung transplants, their complications, and their imaging. So I asked the landscaper, what would you say are the top three problems you worry about the most and why? Without skipping a beat, he told me that, number one, the root. Um, transplanted trees don't have extensive root systems, and enough tree roots have to be integrated into the ground in order for the tree to get enough water to survive at its new location after it's been transplanted. Two, soil compatibility. Non-native trees often have a very tough time adapting to local climate and soils and may not survive. Three, infection. With all the stress that a tree experiences following transplantation, its ability to fight off disease and pests is often weakened. When you look at the discussion of the reasons why lung transplants may fail, it's hard to ignore just how closely the landscaper's concerns about his tree transplant correspond to our concerns with lung transplants. Instead of a tree root, our concern is the bronchial anastomosis at the hilum. Instead of soil compatibility, our concern is graft rejection. And like tree pest or disease, our third major concern after lung transplantation is infection. Whenever I approach lung transplants, even to this day, I always think back to this conversation with my neighbor's landscaper and remember that complications after lung transplantation can be categorized into three basic buckets, bronchial anastomotic complications, graft rejection, and infection. Bronchial anastomotic complications that may occur after lung transplant include bronchial dehiscence, bronchial stenosis, bronchomalacia, and excessive granulation tissue growth at the bronchial anastomosis. Bronchial anastomoses are usually done end-to-end unless there's a size discrepancy between the diameter of the donor and recipient's main stem bronchi, in which case a telescoping anastomosis may be performed. The bronchial arteries are not usually anastomosed in a lung transplant, though some patients may do a vascularized pleural, pericardial, or omental soft tissue wrap around the anastomosis in hopes of avoiding post-operative anastomotic ischemia. Another thing that's not re-anastomosed in lung transplants are the lymphatics. Though lymphatic drainage of the transplanted lung is usually re-established by around a month or so out. Until that time, however, lymphatic drainage of the transplanted lung is impaired, which can contribute to excessive fluid accumulation in the pleural space, a very common complication after lung transplantation. Rejection orders that can occur after lung transplant include primary graft dysfunction, acute rejection, organizing pneumonia, and bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, 
in chronic rejection. Infectious complications that can occur after lung transplant may be bacterial, viral, or fungal in cause and include issues such as typical bacterial, TB, and non-tubercular mycobacterial infections, CMV, and post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, which is a proliferative B-cell disorder associated with Epstein-Barr virus, and fungal infections like candida and invasive aspergillus. Infection is a major cause of morbidity in lung transplant patients and accounts for up to 50% of lung transplant-related deaths. Infections in lung transplant patients can be challenging to manage as a specific causative microbiologic diagnosis may be difficult to nail down in many cases. So why is infection such a problem in patients who've had a lung transplant? Well, although immunosuppressive drug therapy, which may often need to be even more aggressive with lung transplants than with other organ transplants, um, direct exposure of the lung transplant to the external environment, and positive pressure ventilation are major contributing factors, there are additional reasons why lung transplant patients are so susceptible to infections. Denervation of the lung transplant results in a loss of the cough reflux that predisposes patients to aspiration and impaired airway clearance by the mucociliary escalator. Impaired lymphatic drainage, which we referred to earlier in this talk, impairs the transplanted lung from clearing lung infections. And in patients with unilateral lung transplants, problematic microbes present in the remaining native lung can sometimes colonize the transplanted lung. Now that we've created and organized a comprehensive list of lung transplant complications, our next step is, use, is to use our understanding of the pathophysiology for each of these disorders and make an educated prediction and understanding as to how and when these kind of complications will appear on CT imaging. A couple of different issues can lead to dehiscence of a bronchial anastomosis. The bronchial arteries that supply the airways are usually not re-anastomosed during lungs transplantation, which can lead to bronchial ischemia that leads to devitalized bronchial wall and dehiscence. Rejection of the donor allograph by a host immune system can lead to bronchial wall injury and dehiscence. Collateral damage from infections can also lead to bronchial dehiscence. So, how would bronchial anastomotic dehiscences appear on CT? Well, uh, a bronchial anastomotic dehiscence could simply appear as a focal defect of the bronchial wall on CT, and if enough endobronchial air escapes through the wall defect, as focal endobronchial air near the bronchial anastomosis. The outcomes of bronchial anastomotic dehiscence can range from trivial to severe. While some cases may resolve with no issues, some might result in chronic focal bronchial stenosis, and others may even result in a bronchial pleural or bronchovascular fistula, or sepsis. Bronchial dehiscence tends to occur much more often with end-to-end -end anastomoses than telescoping anastomoses. While very small dehiscences might be managed conservatively, large ones over 4 millimeters usually will require surgical repair. Fortunately, bronchial anastomotic dehiscence is a relatively uncommon complication, and partial dehiscences can sometimes be managed by bronchial stenting. Cases of severe dehiscence, though rare, are very concerning where they do occur since the associated mortality rates in these cases is very high. As a functional vascular network, perfusing the bronchial anastomosis takes around four weeks to develop. Most cases of bronchial anastomotic dehiscence, if they occur, will present during the first month post-transplant. The same factors that can lead to bronchial anastomotic dehiscence can also be a cause of bronchial anastomotic stenosis, namely bronchial ischemia, rejection, 
infection, in addition to a dehiscence that has healed. Bronchial stenosis is the most common airway complication following lung transplantation and is defined as and can be recognized on chest CTs as an at least 50% reduction in the expected caliber of the bronchus. Bronchial stenosis is seen more often in lung transplants with telescoping bronchial anastomoses. Bronchial stenosis may be diagnosed any time in the lifespan of a lung transplant from as early as one month post-op to several years later. Bronchomalacia is weakening of the bronchial wall that may occur from bronchial ischemia, rejection, or infection, and is defined as, and can be recognized on CT as, over 50% narrowing of the bronchial lumen on expiration relative to inspiration. The need to observe how the bronchial lumen behaves on expiration is one of the reasons why chest CT protocols for lung transplant patients will contain both an inspiratory and an expiratory phase acquisition. While chest CT is a useful tool for recognizing bronchomalacia in lung transplant patients, bronchoscopy is considered the gold standard. Symptoms can range from asymptomatic to dyspnea, cough, or recurrent infection, and severe cases are usually managed by endobronchial stenting. Bronchomalacia may be diagnosed anytime in the lifespan of a lung transplant from as early as one month post-op to several years later. As we know, some people are prone to form keloids when their skin heals after an injury. I tend to think of granulation tissue uh, growth at bronchial anastomoses in these terms too. Occasionally, a clump of excess connective tissue may develop at the bronchial anastomosis site as it heals and result in a focal and a bronchial opacity present on chest CT, which does not resolve on follow-up imaging. In around a fifth of folks with granulation tissue growth at the anastomosis, the granulation tissue may cause significant airway obstruction. Debridement is the usual management for these cases, though the problem can sometimes recur. Granulation tissue can present as early as month two after lung transplant, but the large majority of cases are diagnosed from seven months post-op to several years later. Now let's move on to rejection disorders, beginning with primary graft dysfunction, or PGD. PGD can go by a couple of other names, such as reperfusion, ischemia, uh, reperfusion edema, ischemia reperfusion injury, and reimplantation response. The causes of PGD appear to be multifactorial, but the end result is injury to the capillary endothelial cells and alveolar epithelial cells in the lung transplant within three days after transplant surgery. This type of injury, which is pathophysiologically similar to diffuse alveolar damage, results in increased permeability of the alveolar capillary barrier. We can imagine how the secondary pulmonary lobules within the lung will look on CT imaging as this kind of process plays out. Initially, the leakage of fluid from within the capillary lumens through the capillary walls will result in the accumulation of interstitial fluid within the bronchovascular interstitium intralobular septi, and interlobular septi, which would result in fine reticular interstitial opacities and interlobular septal thickening within the lung on chest CT. As leakage of fluid across these damaged capillary walls continue and the capacity of the interstitium to soak up this fluid saturated, fluid will begin to accumulate in the alveolar spaces, which on CT will result in not only fine reticular interstitial opacities and interlobular septal thickening, but also airspace opacities that will first appear ground glass on CT, but eventually transition to dense consolidation on a lobule by lobule level. A CT scan of a patient with PGD may exhibit any of these sequelae of capillary, capillary leak edema, namely parabronchovascular thickening, fine reticular interstitial opacities, septal thickening, ground glass opacities, and consolidation. In some patients, the appearance may be homogeneous, while in others, the appearance may be heterogeneous if different regions of lung are at different degrees of fluid saturation. PGD is potentially reversible, though it is associated with a high mortality rate. <laughs>
As we mentioned earlier, if PGD occurs, it will occur on post-op days 0 through 3 after lung transplant. Acute rejection may occur if T-cells from the host become activated, undergo clonal expansion, differentiate into effector cells, and migrate into the lung transplant where they promote perivascular and alveolar septal tissue destruction. Although acute rejection has a different etiology than PGD, it plays out almost identically from a pathophysiologic standpoint at the pulmonary lobular level. The tissue damage results in capillary leak that results in the accumulation of interstitial fluid within the bronchovascular interstitium, intralobular septi, and interlobular septi, which result in reticular interstitial opacities and interlobular septal thickening within the lungs on CT. As leakage of fluid across the damaged capillary walls continue in the capacity of the interstitium to soak up fluid saturates, fluid will begin to accumulate in the alveolar spaces, which on CT results in not only fine interstitial opacities and interlobular septal thickening, but also airspace opacities that first appear ground glass, but eventually transition to dense consolidation on a lobule by lobule level. Chest CT scans of a patient with acute rejection may be visually indistinguishable from PGD and can exhibit any of these sequelae on this slide of capillary leak edema. In some folks, the appearance, again, may be homogeneous, while in others, heterogeneous if different regions of lung are at different levels of fluid saturation. As we proceed, we'll soon realize that the CT imaging features of acute rejection are not only indistinguishable from PGD, but they're also indistinguishable from several other complications to come too, which is why chest CT is of relatively low specificity for acute rejection, which is why diagnoses of acute lung rejection usually require biopsy. Acute rejection usually responds fairly promptly to steroids, but can recur more than once throughout the first year after lung transplantation. The majority of acute rejection episodes occur between two weeks and one year after lung transplant, with the peak being during the first several months. Repeat episodes of acute rejection appear to predispose patients to chronic rejection down the road. Multiple factors may contribute to chronic rejection, um, which um, seems to be a multifactorial um, um, issue. These factors um, are not only ischemia or infection or GERD, but um, prior PGD or acute rejection uh, may also predispose patients to chronic rejection. Although the pathogenesis itself is not completely understood, chronic rejection is a complex inflammatory mediated process that leads to irreversible fibrotic inflammation of the small airways with partial or complete obliteration of the bronchiolar airways in a process we refer to as constrictive bronchiolitis, which used to go by the name bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, or BOS. Obliteration of the bronchiolar airways can result in air trapping, which is most apparent on chest CT images acquired during expiration. While a normal lobule is able to expel its air on expiration and therefore appear slightly denser, an air-trapped lobule will appear much more lucent since it's unable to expel its air. Since this process may play out differently at a lobule by lobule level, expiratory phase chest CT images in patients with chronic rejection may show a mosaic of darker and not so dark lobules we refer to as a mosaic attenuation pattern in addition to bronchial wall thickening. Chronic rejection can be abrupt or insidious in its course and can play out over months or over years. It's an irreversible process and the leading cause of morbidity and late mortality in, li in uh, lung transplant patients. Chronic rejection will usually present in patients after the first year post-lung transplant, with an incidence of 50% at 5 years and 75% at 10 years out from lung transplantation. The final disorder in our category of graft rejection is an entity known as organizing pneumonia. Remember that the definition of pneumonia is not lung infection, but lung inflammation. And organizing pneumonia is an inflammatory lung injury response pattern, a lung injury response pattern that can occur 
from a broad variety of lung insults, ranging from drug exposure to collagen vascular disease to a host's T-cell responses to a lung transplant. In this particular scenario, instead of capillary wall leakage, the host graft response primarily results in the deposition of fibrin, which is a fibrous protein, throughout the distal airways in some of the alveolar spaces and an accumulation of mucinous fluid in these alveolar spaces, resulting in a multifocal distribution of airspace opacities in the lungs that may appear homogeneous or heterogeneous with consolidative or consolidative and ground glass features on chest CT. Organizing pneumonia, or OP, unlike some other lung injury response patterns like UIP, for example, is reversible and usually responds to steroids. There is an association between OP and acute rejection, and OP most often occurs during months 2 through 10 after lung transplantation. Now let's move on to the third category of lung transplant uh, complications, infections, beginning with bacterial pneumonia. Bacterial lung infections usually start within the small airways, where bacteria incite an innate immune response that results in wall thickening and fluid accumulation within the centrolobular bronchioles and their next order branches, uh, leading to a centrolobular and tree and bud nodular interstitial pattern that uh, we explored in depth in our nodular interstitial patterns essentials talk. If permitted to progress, the nodular interstitial opacities caused by the bacterial lung infection at this state begin to expand, resulting in loosely grouped patchy nodular lung opacities with indistinct margins we describe as a multi aster nodular pattern, which can eventually progress to um, partially or completely opacify the secondary pulmonary lobules, leading to either a ground glass or consolidative opacity on chest CT. So the possible imaging patterns of bacterial lung infection in a lung transplant patient will include centrolobular and tree and bud nodular patterns, multi aster nodular opacities, ground glass opacities, and consolidation. Of the different types of organisms that can cause lung infection in a lung transplant patient, bacteria are probably the easiest to culture. In lung transplant patients, gram-negative bacterial infections such as Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, and Klebsiella seem to be the most common. Although bacterial lung infections peak in the first three months after lung transplantation, they are a potential complication that can occur any time in the course of a lung transplant, even a couple of years out. Active mycobacterial infections, including tuberculosis and non-tubercular mycobacterial infections, share a similar pathophysiologic course to um, other bacterial infections, with possible CT imaging features such as a centrolobular and tree and bud nodular pattern, multi aster nodular opacities, ground glass opacities, and consolidation. However, mycobacterial infections tend to be much more challenging for the immune system to eliminate and can result in a chronic course con- associated with more collateral damage and necrosis, as demonstrated by cavitation and lymphadenopathy that can sometimes appear markedly low in its attenuation. Mycobacterial infections, when they occur in lung transplant patients, usually result from reactivation of a site of sequestered latent infection in the patient's other native non-transplanted lung, in patients with single lung transplants, or in sequestered latent infection that was present within the lung transplant itself. When mycobacterial infections um, present in lung transplant patients, they tend to happen at least half a year out from the patient's lung transplantation surgery. However, in the modern era, um, mycobacterial infections in lung transplant patients are uncommon. In some cases of CMV pneumonia, the infection may primarily involve the central lobular bronchioles and result in inflammation that leads to occlusion of the central lobular bronchioles and their immediate branches with mucus, fluid, or pus, resulting in a central lobular or tree and bud nodular pattern. In some patients, these areas may expand or become confluent, leading to small multi aster nodular opacities that are dense and of relatively homogeneous attenuation, and 
partial or complete filling of the airspaces that would contribute to either ground glass opacities or consolidative opacities on chest CT. So the possible manifestations of CMV infection will include a central lobular and tree and bud nodular pattern, multi acinar nodular opacities, ground glass opacities, and consolidation. CMV infections are an important issue we worry about in lung transplant patients. Not only are CMV negative recipients of lungs from CMV positive donors at very high risk and invariably develop infection in the absence of prophylaxis, even CMV positive recipients are at substantial risk too. Universal prophylaxis with antivirals such as valgencyclovir for a predefined period of approximately 6 to 12 months and preemptive therapy consisting of periodic monitoring and initiation of antiviral therapy on CMV DNA detection above predefined thresholds are common practice. In lung transplant patients, CMV infections in unprophylax patients are rare, bec- um, are rare before two weeks post-transplant and usually would occur between months one and six months post-transplant with a peak at three months. The majority of PTLD cases are associated with Epstein-Barr virus, which is a herpes virus that infects around 95% of all adults. In normal immunocompromised hosts, the Epstein-Barr virus remains latent in our B-cell lymphocytes and and is kept in check by our cytotoxic T-cells. However, in patients who we need to immunosuppress in order to prevent lung transplant rejection, the immunosuppression can allow Epstein-Barr virus to activate our B-cell lymphocytes, which leads to an uncontrolled, which can lead to an uncontrolled proliferation of B-cell lymphocytes, resulting in an uh, infection-mediated type of lymphoma that can appear in the lungs as solid nodules or masses, dense consolidation, and bulky lymphadenopathy, which are the three um, main imaging features of PTLD in the chest. PTLD can occur anytime after lung transplant, beginning at around the six-month mark mark uh, post-transplant surgery. The final group of infection complications that can occur in lung transplant patients is invasive aspergillus infection. Aspergillus spores are nearly ubiquitous in typical indoor and outdoor environments, and we all inhale airborne aspergillus spores a lot of the time, and they get deposited within our bronchioles and alveolar spaces. In normal people, however, these aspergillus spores are either removed by our mucociliary clearance elevator or killed by alveolar macrophages. Whatever spores that are left are killed by neutrophils recruited by those macrophages. In patients who we need to immunosuppress in order to prevent lung transplant rejection, however, We introduce a neutropenia and immunosuppression that interfere with this normal response to aspergillus spores, allowing them to proliferate in the lungs, often quite rapidly and extensively. The growth of these aspergillus hyphae will not respect normal anatomic boundaries, and they have no problem just barreling through the walls of things like airways or or, or blood vessels, which can result in hemorrhage or vascular occlusion, leading to nodular infarcts of varying size in the lung that are partially filled with hyphae with zones of hemorrhage along their margins, resulting in the classic appearance of invasive aspergillus, solid nodules or masses with ground glass halos. Tissue necrosis can sometimes occur within these nodules and masses, resulting in internal cavitation which is another hallmark of invasive aspergillus infection in the lung. Angioinvasive aspergillus, as we've illustrated on these slides, is associated with a very high mortality rate, and therefore the form that we're very careful about watching out for on imaging. However, a second form of invasive aspergillus exists that is more common, which is limited to only the airways, which we refer to as airway invasive aspergillosis. This results in a bronchitis, which can appear as bronchial wall thickening and scattered endobronchial opacities on chest CT. Invasive aspergillosis usually presents during months one through six post-lung transplant. 
Okay, we finished reviewing the pathophysiology, CT imaging features, and time windows for all of the complications we need to be familiar with post-lung transplantation. Now, let's start organizing all of these facts and construct a basic pathway we can use, and more importantly, remember for coming up with differential diagnoses when we encounter a chest CT of a lung transplant patient, which may be presenting with complications. We established that there are four bronchial anastomotic complications that can occur in lung transplant patients. Bronchial anastomotic dehiscence, bronchial stenosis, bronchomalacia, and granulation tissue. If bronchial dehiscence occurs, it will usually be sometime during month one post-transplant. If bronchial stenosis or bronchial malacia occur, it will usually be at any time after month one post-transplant. Granulation tissue can present as early as months two through six post-transplant, but when it occurs, will usually be at any time after month seven post-transplant. I tend to be a lumper and not a splitter when it comes to creating guidelines I need to be able to commit to memory, so let's just commit to checking for granulation tissue on any patient two through six months out from transplant just as much as we would for month seven and later. This results in a pretty simple time window and responsibilities. I will always inspect the bronchial anastomoses in lung transplant patients. In patients who are in month one post-transplant, I'll be focused on inspecting the bronchial wall near the anastomosis for any defect and for any extraluminal air near the bronchial anastomosis. If I see either, I will flag the patient for bronchial dehiscence workup. In patients who are in months two and beyond post-transplant, I'll be focused on inspecting the diameter of the bronchial lumen near the anastomosis and its patency. When I see over 50% airway narrowing, I will call bronchial anastomotic stenosis. When I see over 50% airway narrowing on the expiratory phase images relative to the inspiratory phase images, I'll call bronchial malacia. And when I see an endobronchial opacity at the bronchial anastomosis, I'll offer a differential diagnosis of focal mucus versus granulation tissue. If follow-up shows that the endobronchial opacity is unchanged, I will flag the patient for granulation tissue workup. Rejection, related complications, and infection complications in lung transplant patients will result in different imaging patterns in the lung parenchyma. These imaging patterns can be basically divided into three groups, airspace opacities, air trapping, and nodules or masses. In other words, If I see airspace opacities on a chest CT in a patient post-lung transplant, the differential diagnosis I will need to offer will be PGD, acute rejection, OP, mycobacterial pneumonia, typical bacterial pneumonia, and CMV pneumonia. If I see air trapping on their chest CT, the differential diagnosis is chronic rejection. If I see nodules or masses on their chest CT, the differential diagnosis I'll need to provide is angioinvasive aspergillus, and PTLD. However, I can further narrow down my differential diagnosis in many cases due to my knowledge of the time windows during which each complication tends to present. Let's take a case where I see abnormal airspace opacities on a chest CT of a lung transplant patient. Although I know the differential diagnosis will be PGD, acute rejection, OP, CMV pneumonia, mycobacterial pneumonia, and typical bacterial pneumonia, I also know that PGD presents during days one through three post-transplant. I know that most acute rejection presents between week two and one year post-transplant, with the peak being during the first several months. I know that OP most often presents during months two through 10 after lung transplantation. I know that CMV pneumonia usually presents during months one through six um, post-transplant. I know that mycobacterial infections tend to happen at least half a year out from transplant, but that they're rare in the modern era. And I know that bacterial pneumonias can pretty much occur anytime from day one to years out from transplant. Looking at all of these time windows and being a lumper and not a splitter when it comes to creating guidelines I need to commit to memory, I'll basically commit to these streamlined time windows for lung transplant complications 
that present as airspace opacities. That means that when I encounter airspace opacities in a lung transplant patient during days one through three post-transplant, my differential diagnosis is narrowed down to just PGD versus bacterial pneumonia. Anytime in months one through six post-transplant, with the exceptions of days one through three, my leading differential diagnosis is narrowed down to acute rejection, OP, CMV pneumonia, and typical bacterial pneumonia. Anytime in months seven through 12 post-transplant, my leading differential diagnosis is narrowed down to acute rejection, OP, and typical bacterial pneumonia. And in months 12 and beyond post-transplant, my diagnostic considerations will be far and away mainly typical bacterial pneumonia. This results in a manageable, time-based differential diagnosis for lung transplant patients with airspace opacities that we can commit to memory relatively easily, and that will work in the overwhelming majority of chest CTs I'll read. We'll remember that typical bacterial pneumonias are always in the differential diagnosis for airspace opacities in lung transplant patients, whether it's day one or year 10 post-transplant, to which we remember to add PGD in days one through three, acute rejection and OP anytime during the first year, and CMV pneumonia during the first half year. If we happen to see tree and bud nodules, this extra clue allows us to narrow the differential diagnosis down to just infectious um, causes. It goes without saying that, yes, there will be the occasional case that doesn't fit these rules perfectly. For example, a case of acute rejection that presents over a year out, or that rare case of TB in a lung transplant patient. As with any guideline we apply to improve the overall accuracy and efficiency of our practice in medicine, we use them with the knowledge that there'll always be those infrequent cases that don't quite fit the rules and for which our professional experience, education, and judgment will still take precedence. Our knowledge of the time windows during which lung transplant complications that present as lung nodules or masses occur allows us to apply a threshold of around six months for which our leading differential diagnosis will markedly shift from invasive aspergillosis to PTLD. And for lung transplant complications that present as air trapping, especially when it appears after the first year, there's basically one leading culprit constrictive bronchiolitis in the setting of chronic rejection. Now, let's review 10 real chest CTs of patients with lung transplants together and show you how this diagnostic approach we just created works in real life. Here's a patient who's eight months post double lung transplant with an abnormal chest CT. Does the leading problem seem to be a bronchial nasomotic issue, airspace opacities, nodule mass, or mosaic attenuation pattern. I think we can probably all agree that we're primarily dealing with an airspace opacity process here. For airspace opacities in a patient whose months 7 through 12 post-transplant, our differential diagnosis is typical bacterial pneumonia, acute rejection, and OP, which is what I'd offer if I were writing a chest CT report for this patient. In this particular patient, the answer ultimately turned out to be a bacterial pneumonia. Here's another case. Does the leading problem in this patient with bilateral transplants appear to be a bronchial anastomotic issue, airspace opacities, nodule mass, or mosaic attenuation pattern? In this case, we're primarily dealing with an airspace opacity process. For airspace opacities in a patient who is less than three days post-transplant, we can narrow down our differential diagnosis to typical bacterial pneumonia and PGD. In this patient, the answer ultimately turned out to be PGD. How about this patient with bilateral lung transplants? Does the problem seem to be a bronchial anastomotic issue, airspace opacities, nodule mass, or mosaic attenuation pattern in this patient who's two weeks post-transplant? Well, in this case, we're actually dealing with both a bronchial anastomotic and airspace opacity situation. Now, the airspace opacities ended up being bacterial pneumonia and I'd really like to focus on the bronchial anastomotic issue in this case, which is this focal pocket of gas, which is not part of the normal airway lumen, but a contained pocket of extraluminal gas 
that accumulated due to a rather large dehiscence along the anterior bronchial wall at the bronchial anastomosis in this patient less than one month out from their lung transplant. Case four. In this patient with a unilateral left lung transplant, we're dealing with airspace opacities. And for airspace opacities in a patient who is in months one through six post-transplant, but not day one, two, or three, a differential diagnosis we can provide in our, trans in our chest CT report would include typical bacterial pneumonia, acute rejection, OP, and CMV pneumonia. In this particular patient, the final diagnosis ended up being acute rejection. Case five. In this patient with bilateral lung transplants, we're dealing with a nodule mass issue. In a patient who uh, was under six months post lung transplant. Our differential diagnosis for nodules and masses in a lung transplant patient is invasive aspergillus and PTLD. And since this patient fell below that six month threshold, we'd favor invasive aspergillosis, which was the diagnosis in this patient. Case six. In this patient with bilateral lung transplants, we're dealing with airspace opacities, which happen to have a mostly ground glass and um, central lobular nodular interstitial character. For airspace opacities in a lung transplant patient who's in months one through six post-transplant, but not day one, two, or three, our focused differential diagnosis would include typical bacterial pneumonia, acute rejection, OP, and CMV pneumonia. In this particular patient, the final answer after a full workup ended up being CMV pneumonia. Case seven. We've got two simultaneous issues going on here in this patient with a double lung transplant. We've got a bronchial anastomotic issue and an airspace opacity issue. The consolidation in the left lung was known bacterial pneumonia, so I'd like to focus on the pronounced left-sided airway luminal narrowing in this patient who's more than one month out from lung transplant, which ends up being a good example of bronchial stenosis at the bronchial anastomotic, um, anastomosis. Here is a patient with bilateral lung transplants. The inspiratory image at this, um, this is the inspiratory image at the level of the, the tracheal bifurcation, and this is the expiratory phase image. There is a bronchial anastomotic issue here in this patient who's over one month out from his bilateral lung transplants, which is um, pronounced narrowing of the airway on expiration. This observation points us to a diagnosis of bronchomalacia. Case nine. In this case, we have a double lung transplant patient with several solid lung nodules. Our differential diagnosis for nodules and masses in a lung transplant patient is invasive aspergillus and PTLD. Since this patient falls above that, three, that six month threshold, we'd favor PTLD, which was confirmed on biopsy. Finally, case 10. In this patient, who's had bilateral lung transplants three years ago, we have an inspiratory image at the level of the AP window and a matching expiratory phase image at the same level, which corresponds to a pronounced mosaic attenuation pattern due to air trapping. Our leading diagnosis by far for lung transplants this far out with air trapping would be constrictive bronchiolitis in the setting of chronic rejection.